to love us all in our, our, his own unique way. Is that right? We may think we are messed up, but God loves messed up people. Somebody say amen. amen. He doesn't love all the mess, but he loves the person uh, responsible for the mess. He loves the sinner, but he doesn't love the sin. And if he makes that differentiation, we're going to look at that tonight because there's no way, there's no way you would have let this woman in your house once you found out her occupation. You wouldn't have let her in. If you, especially if you were married, you better watch out. You're going, you're going after your man. All right, do I have intrigue now? I yeah. said that's intrigue. Yeah. That's intrigue right now. Better watch out now. Here we come. Act one, scene one. Let's go before the Lord in, in the presence of prayer. Father, we thank you tonight because you're good. We thank you because your word reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley. We thank you, Lord, that you reached down in the gutter one day and pulled us up out of and delivered us from our sinful ways and our sinful self. And though all of us are delivered from sinful ways, we are on a way of progressing to be delivered. And for that, we thank you. For that, we are grateful. And the good news is overflowing today because you love sinners, but even though you hate sin. You love those who've made mistakes. You give second chances. You bless, oh God, to renew and to revive and to refresh. And it's that news we have to tell the world, that we have to be excited enough to tell the world. We thank you for the word. We thank you for how it will prosper in our hearts. And we thank you for the message that will go out from here tonight, that the blessings of the Lord are available to all who seek it, no matter what they've done. We thank you, we love you, we adore you. In Jesus' name, Jesus. amen and amen. amen. Give the Lord a hand clap praise, because you all are here. Like Someone says he saved a wretch like me. Amen. amen. And that's a good thing, and that's a good thing. We all wretches are someone who obviously doesn't deserve a thing, but God saw for that he loved us. Now let's raise the curtain on Joshua and how he, in chapter 2, Joshua the son of Nun, Sent out from Shittim, I'm at verse two, uh, verse one, chapter two. All right, two, they sent out two men to spy secretly, saying, "Go view the land, even Jericho." And they went and came unto and to an harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. All right. So here is Rahab. We're introduced to a lady named Rahab. Her her, her occupation was a harlot. We don't know if she was still plying her trade, yeah. but at the time that they came, she was known in Jericho as Rahab the heart. But God had a mission for them. They didn't just happen to go in that house. Now let's go back and back up, because they were camped outside of Jericho, and they had crossed, if you will, the Jordan, and they had ready uh, now to be in an attack mode against Jericho. Jericho was watching them, Jericho was seeing them, Jericho looked at them, uh, the Jerichoans knew what was coming, and they feared the Israelites. Here were the two million or so people coming outside of the wilderness, camping near the, uh, the Jordan River, and then all the nations that were on the other side getting scared because they're getting ready to be attacked. So they kept watch over, the Jerichoans kept watch over the Israelites. But somehow, uh, Joshua said to the two spies, sneak out of the camp, swim across the Jordan, and go into Jericho. Check it out. Huh? The spy on it. See how, what we're going to need to win. And these two spies had to be brave men. You know the penalty for spying. They kill you. Oh, yeah. uh, it was a risk factor here. It was that intrigue. How many would spy today? Huh? Not me, huh? Listen, they, they can figure out where you're going before you got off your cell phone. Huh? <laughs> So I know then you try to act like this body. You say, oh, no, 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 no. You don't know if you belong here. You're not one of us. The spy is to be able to lie quick, think quick, and be calm about the whole thing and swear on his mother's grave a thousand times. That's how good a spy has to be. So if you're not a cut out for that work, you couldn't do it. But he sent these two men. And they went into Jericho and slipped in, so they fought. They thought they slipped in. They weren't good at spying. They were like we are. They just went on there and, oh, we just come here and do a little service, you know. And they said, hey, shh, king, two spies went in. And he said, what? And the king was on his job. He was scared, but he was on his job. Go get them. And so they, we got to hide. We got to hide. So they ran all over the place looking and found the door that was open. And they went on in there. Whoo, we glad we got out of it. You know how you see on cartoons. You see how the movie Chase, they run in an open door and they, they sink. And so they say for a little while. 
because they went into Rahab's house by happenstance or by providence. Providence means by God's hands. By accident or by God's hands. How many say accident? How many say by God's hands? Because all things work together for what? For the good, for those who are loved the Lord, who are the call, the call of his purpose. So when they found an open door and ran, opened it and ran behind it, it was by the design of God. And the design of God was they went into a harlot's house. Now, uh, somebody would argue, well, red was the color of the red light district back in those days. Well, I don't know if red was, but God is going to use red in a powerful way. And it wasn't going to be for the purpose of going into a harlot's house. In other words, they didn't go into the harlot's house because she was a harlot. They went into the harlot's house because God directed them to find her to save her. Amen? All right. Now, we got that down? Got to have that down because if you don't have that down, you'll be going in there. Don't go in there unless the Lord sees you. All right. I'm trying to make it plain now. All right. Now, verse 2 says, And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Who behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. All right? That was serious. They got, give the, give the heathens credit. They had a greater watch and care for their concern than some Christians. They were watching day and night. Watch that gate. Day and night. Get anybody in here. Huh? They were on their job. And they said, We found two who came in, and they were the homeless. All right? And, and, it was okay. and the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab and said, bring, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they be come to search on all the country. So here was the entry. They thought they were hiding, but they were uncovered. How close is that to being uncovered? We know where you are. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's pretty much being uncovered, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Why does God let us go through close, close calls like that? Uh, where all our thoughts break down and we have nothing to rely on but him. Sometimes our, our, our craftiness can turn to corruption because we have no thoughts left. And when, Lord, it's just in your hands. I can't do anymore. Huh? I just can't do anymore. I was in that situation when my printer broke this week and I had to be in court at 3 o'clock. At 2 o'clock, I was kicking the printer, doing everything, laying hands on it. I would have anointed it if I could have. And it still didn't print, Sister Jane. And I said, what is I'm going to do? <laughs> and it, with the printer that came out, the sheet was just like it needed more ink. And I knew it didn't need more ink because I just bought the ink. So I could have choked it. But it was, a, it was a machine. So I said, Lord, I'm in your hands. So I wrote out what I could. And the other part of the document was tied nice and neat and pretty yeah, yeah. to me, just like a term paper. But the first page didn't come out. I could have killed that problem. But it wasn't alive. And the Lord said, go on anyway. Tell the judge your printer broke and you'll give him another sheet later. Got down there. Nobody got excited about that page. And when I got to judge, I said, judge, this printer broke. He said, I used to do it right. Don't even worry about this. Everything is fine. You're going right through it. I said, why did the Lord not make that shit come out? <laughs> I could have kicked it. Yes, you could have. When you hot for something and you got to have the document at that moment and time is coming down and you're feeling the pressure, you would have kicked it too. But anyway, I didn't. I should still do that. But God let me get close enough to see whatever situation I got in. He could tell What a lesson. What a lesson. You walk by faith and not by sight, and you get close to the end, and there's no more runway, and you're about to step off, and God catch you before you fall. Oh, amen. Thank you. Isn't that what God does? Yes, he specializes. Yes, he Just so I can know he's a deliverer. Yes, he is. He's a deliverer. Yes, he so here the spies ran into the harlot's house. The king knew where they were and was about to <laughs> knock on the door. And he, they were looking at Rahab for the first time. They didn't know who she was, she, and they didn't know her temperament for them. Because you can look at somebody and think, oh, Jesus, I'm in trouble now. Yeah. And then they can come out with a softest voice. Do you need some help? <laughs> I mean, oh, yeah, you're in trouble now. Either way, God can work their heart. The king's heart is in the Lord's what? Hand. That's what the scripture said. So you don't know. The judge's heart in the king's hand. Uh, the Lord's hand. And anybody's heart, who be may be your enemy, he's all in the Lord's hand. So they looked at her for the first time. What are you going to do? And she said, listen, there's some stalks of flax 
on my roof. I want you to get up there and hide it. And when they come, I'm going to deal with them. You don't worry about them. I know how to deal with them. And they got up there. Would you have gotten up there? That was no choice. You'd have climbed that roof. Come on, help me get up here. And hide in the stalks of flax. And they hid and put them over them. Self and hid well and didn't breathe loud, children. You know, they say, <gasps> You can't be breathing loud and they're fine. Who's up there breathing loud? You go, ah, All right, I'm helping you out of here. All right, all right. Now, here's the story. So they knock on the door and they say, Where are they? Because we saw them come in here. Now she's caught. So what is she going to do? Well, that's this thing in ancient culture that you do not let anyone who's come under your roof lose their life. In Eastern culture, that is a powerful story about that. What was the movie that was just in uh, the theaters now talking about uh, Last Man? That was the movie, Last Man? Yeah. With the um, uh, 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 Navy SEAL mm -hmm. and all that. They fought. Long Survivor. Last Man. Long Survivor. Long Survivor. Long Survivor. The mo I went to see Long Survivor. Bloody movie. But it was a good movie. In the end, one man survived. I said, obviously, the title imposed. And he said, how did this man survive over in Afghanistan? Yeah. How did he survive when they were all ready to kill him? Because the, the good guys, the Afghanistanians, had caught him. The good guys caught him and said, no, we're not going to kill him. Yeah. The bad uh, Taliban came and said, kill him, kill him. He's an American. We're going to kill him. And, the, and, the, and they were ready to cut his throat. And the good guys that were Afghanistan, who, all, who were living in the village, surrounded the bad guys and said, he's my house guest. And as long as he's my house guest in my culture, you will not kill him. Now you drop your guns and get out of here. And they said, we're dropping our guns, but we're going to come back and we're going to kill this village. We're going we to slaughter this village. And they came back to slaughter the village as they were slaughtering it. I think the, the story came out that the Americans came and saved that, that lone survivor. Mm -hmm. But the only one that saved him initially was the man under whose house and roof he came. Mm -hmm. And that's a very valuable culture in the Eastern culture, uh, that if you come under my roof, I will, no harm will come to you while you're there. That's almost a sacred moral duty. So this man survived and lone survivor. And here was the harlot saying, you have come under my roof. You are under my protection. I will protect you, even though I have to tell a lie to the king's men. Do you see that? You serve, there's a time when you serve God, and God is greater than your country. It's God first, country second. No, country third, actually. Uh, God, family, and country. You got that right? God first, family second. And country third. It's not country over God, it's not country over family. Because people have fled countries to save their family. They're known as refugees. So here, our story takes a twist because now the harlot is going to say, They're not here. And y'all can say, Who represented that a lot? Yes, it is. Who wasn't she uh, ashamed to tell her not? No, she wasn't because they came under her roof. Now you have that understanding now? Now I have to move on. Because when they came under her roof, then she said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix it because we have heard about your God. I'm telling the story now rather than reading it. We've heard about your God, how he dried up uh, the Red Sea and crossed. That was 40 years earlier. So the, the story was still being told 40 years after it had been done. Then he, of course, was ready to drive the Jordan and let him cross over. But they said, we've heard how he's defeated the Amalekites and, and their two kings. And how you all are, boy, you all are notorious. You all are great warriors when God is with you. And so we, we're afraid of you. They were afraid of him. So that was what she was saying. Now, 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 she says, uh, I'm not going to tell them. And you got to do me a favor. So they hopped up on the roof and they listened to her as the guards said, where are they laughing? She said, they're gone. They were here, but they gone. In fact, if they don't, if you hurry, you can catch them and overtake them because they went out at the gate at night. So apparently it was a two-day thing. They saw them come in early, and then they whispered it to the king, and then they slept that night or whatever, and then the next night, because the Bible says they lodged at her house. Then the next day they found out about it, and she had to go up on the roof and stay there. But she was telling them at sundown, uh, they, they're going to close the gate. You stay on that roof till sundown. And then she gets up there on the roof and said, listen, I've just done it. The king's men were here. They were here to get you, and I told them that you were left. Now, I want to I wanna do some trading here. All right. I've done you a good deed. Will you do me a good deed? Yeah. Was that a good, smart thing to do? Yeah, man. 
And they said, yes. And she said, I'm going to help you get out of the city because the gate is closed now. And when the gate is closed, nobody can go out of it. How are you going to look going up there with a bunch of strangers talking about open the gate? They're going to get you and arrest you. So she says, tell you what, since my house is on the wall, and Jericho had two walls, and they were 30 feet high. Everybody say 30 feet. 30 feet. Because after you climb three feet, you get dizzy, huh? You're talking about 30. They were high as a, a billboard on an expressway. If you see a billboard and you pass it, those babies are 33 feet high. That was the height of the walls of Jericho, and they trusted in those walls. We know the story about those walls. All right? So now, she, her house was on the, on the wall, and there were two walls, because I'm holding up two hands, an inner wall, an outer wall, and an inner wall. And her house was on the outer wall, and the back window to her house was on the outer wall. So she says, since the gate is locked, there's no way you can go through the gate. But I have a scarlet card. And a card in those days was looked up on as a rope because it had to hold the weight of a man. And so she tied the scarlet card around something that was sturdy and fixed. And then she told the man, let yourself down by the scarlet cord. And then she said, when you get down there, remember I've done kindness to you. And they said, uh, well, they said, our life for yours. If, if you breathe a word of where we are, we're free from the oath. But if you keep your mouth closed and don't tell anybody, the same cord I want you to, they said, take and tie in your window huh, as a, as, a, as a message to them and then put it in the window. And when they come to your house and we come to take over the city, if the scarlet cord is hanging in the window, everybody in that house will be saved. And if they come out of the house, they're going to get killed, and the blood is not on us. But if they stay in the house where the scarlet cord is, they will be saved. What are you saying, Reverend Vincent? God was working at both ends of the rope. The first thing, the rope had to be long enough to let the spies down. And this rope represents the blood of Jesus. <laughs> Make no mistake about it. It reached all the way down to the ground where they didn't have to jump and break an ankle. When they got off that 30-foot high wall, that baby had to be more than 30 feet high and to let them down, and they came down without a problem. Then the gate was shut, so this was the only way they could get out. Is Jesus not the way, the truth, and the life? No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Then look at the aspect of Rahab. She said, I want you to save when I, I want you to say my mother, that's what she started with, my father, my brother, and my sisters. She was not selfish in what she wanted. She was not saying, just save me. Came to church for my blessing and I got mine. <laughs> she said, I want you to save my whole family. And this is an episode in the Bible, a scene, where God saves the entire family. And we don't know whether they believed in God, but Rahab believed in God. Yeah. And God, how, would they, how would Joshua send spies in the first place unless God must needs go through Jericho like Jesus must needs have gone through Samaria? You remember Jesus in the fourth chapter of John says, I must needs go through Samaria. Why? Because there was one woman there who had had five husbands and the man she was shacking up with wasn't her husband. Am I telling the truth? Yes. Or am I talking to strangers? No. Somebody say amen. Because you read the Bible. Amen. And Jesus said, I must needs go through Samaria to save this woman. And he took his itinerary and went through Samaria, even though Jews did not have him. And he asked the lady to give me the drink. And she says, why are you talking to me, a Samaritan, who am a Jew? We know the story. But Jesus said there was one in that heathen town that needed to be saved. That was the woman of Samaria. And we get to Jer and we get to Jericho. That was one woman. Jericho was a heathen city. It was a Canaanite city. It practiced all kind of abominations. We'll just leave it at that. They did all kind of crazy stuff, real crazy stuff. But the Lord says there's one man that I won't say. Joshua sent two spies, and then when the spies got there, put enough pressure on them to make them run in to Rahab's house. And then Rahab was ready because Rahab said, "I have heard about your God." I have known him to be somebody who is powerful, and I want you, I want to be saved. I don't want to stay in this city and be doomed. 
So in other words, Rahab, may, she may have been a harlot, but she was being delivered. She may have been a sin-rich city, but God was going to say, I'm going to get you out of that sin-filthy city because it's rich in sin and devoid of any faith. So God saw her, and through a series of what looked like improbable events, he lined up everything, put them in the right house. Then he said, I'm going to get them down, even though the gate is closed. That was like my printer breaking down. The printer's broke, I'm going to get out of here. There's the rule. Get on down. You got a hand? Write that stuff out. And it went on down the line. Is that what God did? And got them saved. And then he said, now the same thing that delivered them is going to deliver you. Tired in the winter. And then get your mama, get your daddy, get your brothers, get your sisters, get your whole family, and come in there and stay in there. Now, we know what happened. Let's go over what happened. When it was this God across Joshua over the Jordan, and they were camped out, and he said, the captain of the Lord's army came to Joshua and said, you're going to go around Joshua, uh, Jericho, seven times, but six days, you're going to go around and not say anything. On the seventh day, I want you to go around seven times and give a shout out, and the walls are going to fall down. Flat. Flat. Yeah. All the walls. So they went out six days. They went around the city. You remember that? Mm -hmm. And the Jerichos were terrified. Mm -hmm. And then after day one, they went around the city, day two, day three, and they got kind of cocky and confident. Look at them coming out of these balls. They can't get these balls. You know about the fifth day, they're probably drinking some juice, huh? Mm -hmm. On the wall, they ain't coming in here, you know, like a drunk person on New Year's Eve. Sixth day came, but the seventh day came. Lord said, don't open your mouth. Don't open your mouth. Don't open your mouth. Anybody open their mouth, they're thrown out of line. Shut up. We're going to march around that seventh <coughs> time. And on the seventh time, open. And they gave out a great praise on the seventh time. And God inhabits the praises of his people. And when the praises go up, blessings do what? And the walls fell down flat. All the wall fell down flat, except the wall where the woman's house was. I just got that recently. That just came in hot off the press. All the wall fell, except the part where the woman's house was. Why? Because the Lord upholded those in his hand who are his. And it would be a monument of praise that everybody was going to die but the lady and her household. Isn't that amazing? How do you know that? Because she survived because when they went in, they killed up all the inhabitants of Jericho except those who were in the house with the scarlet cord. <clears throat> the scarlet cord was a symbol to all the soldiers. Don't bother that house yet. And then when the walls fell, the walls, all the walls fell but the wall that he supported that house. That's amazing thing, isn't it? Now, God will uphold you even in the midst of a storm. He gives you peace. And you can be the only one. Hallelujah. Tornadoes have come to cities and gone through whole blocks of devastation, got to a house and made a turn and saved you. But yes, you have heard it, and you're going to hear it again this year. When tornadoes season, like, you're going to hear it again. When, Lord, we came out of the cellar, our house was gone. But thank God we were here. Some people say, it missed the house. It skipped over. Why did that happen? And you see a police, you see a crucifix in the window. Huh? He said, oh, Jesus, he came down and saved our house. That's, God has his own ways and provisions. And this lady who was Rahab and who was still called a harlot, I don't believe she was still plying her way. I believe her name stuck, but she was not plying her trade. I believe just like Simon the leper was called Simon the leper long after he was healed. This lady was called Harlot, and she was called Harlot in the book uh, in the New Testament. But she was not behaving like one. She was behaving like a saved, sanctified child of God. She saved the spies, and the spies saved her. And what do you know about that? This woman came out of that situation with her entire family, and Rahab said, oh, thank you. Can you imagine her coming out after the walls had fallen, kind of like a tornado, and saying, look at the devastation of, woo, but the Lord keepeth thee. He that keepeth thee neither slumber nor. She started praising God. Look at her. I kept my house up when everybody else's house was down. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall love him. She must have prayed a prayer of thanksgiving. And when she did, she went on into the camp of Israel. And later, she must have been looking pretty good, y'all, because she married Solomon. She married. She married into the 12 tribes of Israel. And do you know, when she married Solomon, they gave, uh, she and her husband gave birth to Boaz. 
You don't say, who is Boaz? Go to the book of Ruth. Yeah. Boaz was the kinsman redeemer who married Ruth. I believe Rahab and Ruth probably met during their lifetime. Why? Because Rahab was Boaz's mother. And Ruth would be his wife. And when you get to the book, watch this, of the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapters 1 and 2, you find these two Gentile brides being brought into the lineage of Jesus Christ. Rahab was the great, great, great grandmother of David. And she was therefore the great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus Christ. Jesus brought two Gentile brides into his lineage. And there's a third bride he's going to bring in. The third bride is the church. We who are the church comprise that we will be caught up to meet him in the air. And then we will go to the feast of the marriage supper when the church will be presented as a bride adorned in white, coming down with fine linen, and Jesus, that will be the bride, and Jesus will be the groom, and we will, if you will, have our natures merged and changed forever by Jesus' presence, and so shall we be with him forevermore. The third bride is the church. And the blood is what gets us ready. And someone says the cord is the blood that runs from the Genesis all the way to Revelation. The blood of Jesus runs from Genesis. Yes, it did. In Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve were found out naked, the word came, there can be no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. And therefore, an innocent lamb was killed so that Adam and Eve would have coverings. That previewed the coming attraction of Jesus dying. So all from Genesis to Revelation, it's tied with the cord of blood. And if you take the cord out of the Bible would fall of blood, it would fall down. But everything sacrifices by blood. Peace offerings by blood. Everything is tied. And then Jesus comes as the final atonement and wraps up our whole nature and says, anybody who passes under the blood, anybody who passes under the blood, just like anybody who would come in the house passes under the blood. And today, your faith, your, your, your faith and your future has been determined by you passing under the blood. Shirley Caesar sings that. Under the blood. My faith and my future is under the blood. You haven't seen what God's going to do yet. You just think you're chilling it now. Wait till you see when your nature takes off and goes from a terrestrial being where you lay down in death and wake up in glory with a new body. Wake up with bodies that don't ache and pain anymore. Wake up with with a body celestial fitted for eternity for eons of millions of years and you're still floating around like you're 20 years old. That's the way it is. God ain't going to make you old. But amen, when you get to heaven, ain't going to be no old folk. If you're old, you just choose to be that way for a day or two, a minute or two. But when you're in eternity, God is going to make you forever and ever, I believe, youthful, vigorous, and, and vibrant. God's going to make all those things. Because there will be no time. Time will be no more. So the joy of our salvation is that Jesus is the blood. And when you pass under that blood, you're forever safe. Now the good news, I think, as I'll close, we have to tell people is Rahab was called still a prostitute. But she wasn't. Rahab had lied and consorted uh, and, and deceived her own king. So she was guilty of treason. Rahab had falsified official information by saying, they ain't here. <laughs> but God blessed her anyway. Do you know God loves us in our foolishness? And the greatest news we can tell somebody is what I go back to what the Lord told me to tell those young people. You don't have to put down your beard yet. Because the love of God is big enough to love you through it. We all have faults. We all have problems. We all have failures and disabilities, but God says, I love you through those. My love reaches to you. My love gets down to you. My love will help you. And this is what we got to tell. This is good news. We can't tell the world, you got to get right and come to church. No, you got to get right and get saved and then come to church. Because coming to church won't save you if you don't ex and pass under the blood of Jesus and don't catch hold. So tonight, the Lord worked at, hold that child, John, and sister, can you hold that? The Lord worked at both ends 
of the road. He saved the spies, he saved the lady, and they all ended up together in the camp of Israel. Thank you very much. Y'all got the message? All right, God bless you. My other shall keep you, and that's why I was wearing birds.